Okay. Does that work? Yes. That works. I don't have to yell at you like I have to yell at my kids. Um, so I'm all that stands between you, dessert, and Rod's next drink. <laughs> and um, and uh, you, you heard from preacher Rod uh, earlier in the evening, and you're going to hear from the teacher, Valerie, because that's um, kind of my style. So Sh Sh Sharon asked me to kind of give you an overview of where FFB is headed in research. And I'm sure many of you in this room uh, know about the excitement of the recent phase one clinical trials for gene therapy and some of the proof of concept experiments for cell transplantation to restore vision in blind animals. And those are really exciting developments. And, uh, and there's a lot of hope around that field right now and there's a lot of momentum. But I know that patients and their families um, always find that pace very, very slow and the cures are not fast enough. But um, Rod did, did emphasize how complicated everything is and I just wanted to give you a perspective from the glasses half full about how far we actually have come and what we've learned and what it took to get to those just two major developments. So okay, genes. Well the first RP gene was cloned in 1990, so it's been 20 years. Cloning those genes was absolutely essential to figure out why the retina actually degenerated when these genes were mutant. Because we actually didn't know that, and you needed to know that to know what kind of cells that you had to fix. I mean, it was fine to say you lost your vision, but you had to know the mechanics of why. Why did the toaster stop working? Um, and until you do that, you couldn't even figure out a treatment. So figuring out what these genes did, en route to even figuring out a gene-based treatment, required lots of work from basic science labs, people working in cell culture, growing cells in a dish, people modeling diseases in, in mice and larger animals like cats and dogs. And sub subsequently, we probably cloned over 100 RP genes. I'm probably, that's an underestimate right now. And that's had a big impact. We know a lot about, more about the disease. Patients can get genotyped. And that actually has had a huge, huge effect for patients and their families. They've kind of got ownership over their disease. And that led to eventually the trials for gene therapy using adenoviruses to deliver RPE65 to treat one form of Leber's. And you also have to realize that over that 20-year span, there were big, big advances in other fields um, that absolutely had to happen for gene therapy to even be a re reality. And for example, a really good one is just the virology field. People worked for years on vector development to try and get gene therapy to work. And I should also tell you, there was a huge setback that set the field back 10 years in terms of gene therapy. And that's why things also took so long, because they realized they had to do this super carefully so that patients' health and safety was put first. And so now we're in phase one, two clinical trials for labors. And there's a number of groups, some of them funded by FFB Canada, um, who are developing gene therapy protocols for other types of retinal de degenerative diseases. Um, so there's also big, big hope for stem cell uh, transplantation for the retina. And again, this is built on decades of work, of basic research, people slogging it out. And it's got a really nice Canadian twist. I mean, hematopoietic blood bone marrow stem cells were discovered in Canada by Till and McCullough here in Toronto at the OCI in the 60s. Um, and when I was training and going to school and my mother was yelling at me about all the stupid things I did, I always heard you could never fix your brain. There was no hope, that was it. You gotta look after yourself because we can never make new neurons. And that's how the field thought for a long, long time, that things were not plastic. That was it. You were born with a number of neurons and and God help you, that's it. Well, that turns out not to be the case. And another Canadian researcher in 1992 described the first evidence for a cell that you could pull out of a human, of, out of an a, a adult brain that would grow in vitro and make new neurons. That was revolutionary. That changed how everyone thought about a lot of things. Um, and it led people to do kind of innovative work, including the work by uh, Vince Tropepi and his uh, mentor, Der van der Kooy who described a population of cells from an adult human retina that behaved like stem cells and that could make photoreceptors. Again, that just changed the way everybody thought about what might be feasible in terms of treatment for retinal disease. And so um, there's um, many, many work that led up to the, the work in the late 2000s by Robin Ali's group where they went and um, 
transplanted photoreceptors from one animal into blind hosts and showed that could improve vision. But I, that, that's a wonderful um, experiment. It was a really important proof of concept because it said that you know a diseased retina, although people had hoped this would happen, had hypothesized this would happen, would be receptive to new cells. And it seems to work. Um, but even that experiment was built on decades of hardcore basic science from labs all over the world um, trying to understand the genes that control retinal development, developing tools that would have e that were even that facilitated those experiments to be done in the first instance, and um, even the animal models that were being used in that experiment. So stem cell transplantation, it works in animals to a limited extent, and there's a large number of hurdles in the field that have to be overcome to make that a reality. For example, we have to figure out what are the best sources of stem cells. There's, there's labs all over the world working on that problem. How to make them turn into photoreceptors. And again, they're hijacking the information that we have from decades of work on how the eye develops. How do you get those cells to survive? That involves the observations from a number of other fields of biomedical research. Mm -hmm. How do you transplant those cells? How do you get them to integrate and stay in there? Again, all of those solutions are going to come, but they're going to come from a lot of hard slog of research. Um, and it's going to come from a lot of innovation. Um, there's going to be people who are going to, transit to, to cross fields of different cell biological fields, even bioengineering, to solve that problem. So I'm going to reiterate a bit about what Rod said. So what do you do? Who do you fund? And I'd say none of this research is done in a vacuum. Researchers all talk to one another. They read each other's papers. They review each other's papers. Uh, they review each other's grants. They go to meetings. They communicate. And they publish. And that information is all out there. And they all make use of that. And so the important thing is to fund the best research, fund outstanding, excellent people, fund translational research, absolutely, but also fund fundamental discovery research because that's going to lead to in innovation, because people are going to find new things, new ways to target disease, and that's only going to happen when you let people do what they do best. And the FFB has always understood that, um, and they've always supported outstanding research. There's research grants based on gene therapy, uh, stem cell therapy, gene discovery, but also fundamental cell biology work on how the retina develops, on why eye disease happens in the first instance. And I think that's the only way to get to safe, new, and effective therapies. So I know many of you have been strong supporters of the FFB. And as a researcher, I thank you very much. And rest assured that tomorrow we'll be all closeted in that room, arguing for four or five hours over who really deserves that money and who's really going to have the biggest impact with your funds. So I thank you very much. Thank you.